Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we're going to take a look at another video that focuses on topics 110 to 113 out of the CED which is all about continuity. And this particular example is example four in your notes. And the focus here is going to be to find these constant values that are present in this piecewise function in order to make this piecewise function continuous everywhere. So the problem reads like this. We've got this piecewise function k of x and we want to find these values a and b so that k of x will be continuous. And we want to make sure that we use very good proper notation throughout, right? We wanna make sure that we communicate well. And we see that our piecewise function does consist of three pieces. So let's take a look at what we've got. The top piece, x squared minus four over x minus two when x is less than two, doesn't really have any of those constant. It's sort of uh, predictably behaved. But of course, this middle piece, the presence of the a and the b, cause a little bit of issue. We're not quite sure what that quadratic is going to look like. Any more that when we are uh, no more than, than we know what that bottom piece is going to graph, the 2x minus a plus b. So <clears throat> what does this all focus on? Well, it focuses on the definition of continuity. And we have to remember, there are three things that have to be true in order a function to be continuous at a point. And man, do you want in those, you want these three things to kind of be rolling off your tongue. You want to make sure that you have these backwards and forwards in your memory banks. Number one, the function has to be defined at that value. Now that's not going to be a big issue here so much. And the reason that I say that is that x minus 2 is causing some issues with this denominator. However, this particular piece is not defined when x is equal to 2, only when x is less than 2. So that's not a problem. Notice that 2 is going to be used in the domain for this polynomial, which we know is going to exist. All polynomials are going to be continuous. And then three is going to be part of the domain for the third piece. And that again is a polynomial. So it's not an, an issue of whether or not f of two exists or f of three. We know that they're going to exist. What the focus is, is the limits. Do the limits exist? Will this graph all come together at these nice, points where they meet up or will it have breaks in it? Well, we can control that because we can decide what A and B have to be. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you something that I'm going to present to you here towards the end. Now, this is going to kind of get you guys thinking. I've gone ahead and sketched the graph of this piecewise function with the A and the B values that we don't know, which are going to serve as sliders. And so when I initially put these into the TI Inspire, the calculator knew that A and B were going to be sliders. And basically, I can kind of move the B and the A value around. And it, of course, changes the graph. So right now, with the default settings of A equaling 1 and B equaling 1, you can certainly see we have a hot mess on our hands, right? We have a, well, we have a function that certainly isn't continuous, right? There's two issues. There's two breaks in it. So what is it going to take in order for these three things to all connect? And that's what this problem is going to focus on. So if we get back to the problem, we are now going to be thinking about the idea of the limit. We have to show that the limit as x approaches 2 from both sides exists. And we have to show that the limit as x approaches 3 from both sides exists. So we have two phases of that limit to worry about. So first of all, we're going to show good notation. So you're going to say, what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of k of x? And what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of k of x? Are they equivalent? Well, we're about to find out. So for the left side limit, one thing that we notice right away is that we can do some factoring. And I'm going to go ahead and make that factoring happen. The x squared minus 4 becomes x minus 2, x plus 2. And then, of course, the denominator x minus 2 is going to lead to this wonderful cancellation. And lo and behold, what we have is an x plus 2. Now, that is what we call a green light limit at Avon High School. So you can replace this x with that 2 and you can come up with the answer of four. So there's no doubt that that limits four. Now, if we move to the middle function as x approaches two from the right side, we are then basically going to be able to green light once again, because 
the function for kx is just this arbitrary ax squared plus bx plus 3. But as soon as we green light and plug that 2 in for x, now make sure that you know that that 2 does replace x, we would have 4 times a plus 2 times b plus 3. Now what do we know about these two limits? Well, if we want this function to be continuous, we know that these two limits are going to have to equal each other, all right? So immediately, we're going to set 4a plus 2b plus 3 equal to 4, and we know that is a fact. But the problem is, is we can't do anything about this fact. It is a single equation with two unknowns, and we don't really work with those very well in algebra, all right? So... Let's kind of put that off to the side and let's focus on this idea of the three. Let's find the limit as x approaches three from the left of our k of x and compare that with the limit as x approaches three from the right of this k of x. Well, from the left side, once again, it seems like uh, we've been here before. We're gonna use that middle piece because to the left of three is when x is less than three. So we have a very similar situation from before. Now the only difference is we're going to replace the x with three. And upon doing that, we would get nine times a plus three times b plus three. Let's do the same thing as x approaches three from the right. In this case, we're finally gonna get a chance to use our bottom piece the 2x minus a plus b. And once again, we have a green light limit on our hands because we just have a polynomial. So if we insert three for x, we end up with six minus a plus b. And I'll ask it again, what is it that we have to know about those two limits? Well, they have to be equivalent to each other. That is the only way that this function k has any chance of being continuous. Now we're in business, you guys. Now we have a system of two equations. So we sort of dust off our ability to solve systems of two equations. Typically, those are presented in these braces. And it doesn't really matter what form you want to get each of your equations in. I'm a big fan of standard form, where we have like the a and the b value, in this case, all on the left side of each equation and then the constant on the right side. You can set them up any way that you want, though. So if I decide on that particular form, then for this first equation, I'm just going to subtract 3 to the right, and boom, there I go. Now, the second equation, this red equation, might take a little bit more thinking because I'm going to add the negative a to the left side, so I would have a 10a. I'm gonna subtract b over, so I would have plus two b. And then when I subtract three to the right side, six minus three is gonna, of course, be three. And now you start thinking about what is the best way to solve this system of equations. Well, I have to admit, I'm a big fan of the elimination method, especially in a case like this, because you already have the coefficients of b being the same. Now granted, they don't have the same sign, but we can get by by just maybe subtracting these two equations, okay? So if we subtract the two equations from each other, it doesn't matter what order we subtract them in. I might take the bottom equation minus the top. Do you see why I decided to do that? Well, because it gives us a nice positive answer on each side. Otherwise, you'd have negative 6a equal negative 2, which doesn't really matter because you're still going to get the same answer, one-third. Be careful that answer is one-third and not three. Now that you found that a value, you simply have to plug that back into either of these two equations. Does not matter which. It seems like the top one might be as good as any. Replace that a with one-third and now solve for b. Four times one-third is four-thirds. We subtract four-thirds over to the other side. One minus four-thirds, I believe, is negative one-third. And then when we divide by two, we have negative one-sixth. So you have found the value of A and B that's going to satisfy the directive of the problem that makes this K of X function continuous. Now, 
I would love to go back to the graph. I would love to see how we can actually see that visually. So if I return to the graph, I notice there's a little bit of a problem innately with the TI Inspire in the way that it sets up its slider settings. If I were to click on these arrows, I'm only allowed to move an integer's values and integer values, right? From one to two, et cetera. And I can go to the negative integers as well. And I don't think that that's what I want to do here because I want slider values that have what? One third and negative one sixth. So what I can do is I can go into the slider setting by hitting control menu and change the setting for slider A. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my step size be equivalent to one third. One divided by three, let's do that. Or maybe even one divided by six, if you want, okay? I'll leave this one as one third, but you're gonna notice that the other one's going to have to change. Now, a little word of warning, notice what happens. If I had my slider set at one, I'm now gonna just take off from where one is and have one and one third, one and two thirds, et cetera, et cetera. But if I wanna take this back to where just A is going to be one third, that's where the A value should be set. Now let's do the same thing for B. Let's change its settings. So I'm gonna click on it, hit control menu. Whoops, make sure you hit, click the slider setting. <laughs> there we go. I think we're on it now, maybe, maybe control menu. Try that one more time. Slider B, when you get two sliders so close together, it's easy to kind of get them all mixed up. So I'm gonna change the settings for this slider. Now this one certainly has to be one sixth because we know its answer was negative one over six. So I'm gonna hit okay for that. And now as I move the slider down, it takes on values of one sixth. There's three sixths by the way, two sixths, one sixth, which is about 0.16 repeating, right? There's our funny way of saying zero, <laughs> and then boom, there is our negative one sixth. And did you see what happened to the graph? Maybe we were so concerned with the sliders, we kind of missed that the graph all of a sudden got all pretty on us, didn't it? But if I were to deviate these sliders from what they're supposed to be, we don't get that continuity. But when I make A one third and B negative one sixth, we have that nice smooth continuity that we were looking for. Anyway, I hope this helps and we'll see you at the next video.